A Ryanair Boeing 737 flies overhead. I pull out my phone to open Flight Radar 24 as usual. After verifying that the aircraft was a Boeing 737-800 Next Generation, registered EI-EBE, flying from Porto to Birmingham, I was going to switch it off. Having a few moments prior applied a 737-only filter, I then noticed a lone 737 out across the Atlantic. The thought then occurred to me that the longest narrowbody flight I had been on was a mere three hours from Doncaster Sheffield International Airport to Debrecen. So why is it that, nowadays, a lone 737 out in the middle of the Atlantic is not a spectacular phenomenon? And why is this becoming common? So in short, why are narrowbody aircraft the future of long-haul flights? Just quickly before we start, what's the longest narrowbody flight you've been on? Let me know in the comments below. So, what do we mean by the term narrowbody aircraft? Well, it's just that, a narrow aircraft. Another term commonly used is single aisle aircraft, which is also just that, an aircraft with a single aisle. Now, some examples of these aircraft are, as I'm sure you all know, the Airbus A320 and the Boeing 737. So the idea of flying these planes long haul may seem a bit daunting, but where did this idea originate from? The Boeing 707 is renowned for starting a revolution in airplane design and technology. And guess what? It was a narrow body. While it didn't have the range of a modern long haul aircraft, say the A350 or 777, it did still have a long range. In fact, it flew between Madrid and Buenos Aires without a sweat. So if long haul began with narrow bodies, why is it no longer the standard? Now, go and ask your friend who knows absolutely nothing to name a plane. What did they say? Spitfire, Concorde, Jumbo Jet, stop! Jumbo Jet, you say? Well, there is the answer. The Jumbo Jet was, as I'm sure you all know, the Boeing 747. And the last time I checked... Yeah, it's big. And how many aisles does it have? One, two... Alright, oh, yeah, two. Which, thanks to my high school education, has let me know that two is bigger than one. I know, it's impressive. So that is why we don't fly long haul on narrow bodies. Following the 747 was the 767. Still a wide body. Then, of course, Airbus's first plane, then ended up being a dual aisle, and you get the picture. So when do single aisle aircraft return to the long haul sector? Well for that, we'll have to fast forward to the 757. And here we go again, long haul narrow body flights. Examples are Newark to Stockholm, Keflavik to Portland, Malaga to New York, etc, etc. And there you have it folks, narrow bodies are back. Can we have a round of applause? The 757 was a powerhouse of an aeroplane, and with the changes in ETOP regulation, it became a popular plane in some regard. While it did do well, the idea of long-haul single-aisle point-to-point -point routes didn't work. Nowadays, if an airline has the 757, they want to keep it for as long as possible. Why is this? As I just mentioned, the idea of long-haul single-aisle point-to-point routes didn't work for many airlines because airlines tended to operate on a hub-and-spoke model. This essentially means that airlines flew flights in and out of their hubs, requiring people to connect at the airline's hubs. A prime example of this is Emirates. Emirates is based in Dubai, and if you fly with them from, say, London to Mumbai, you'll fly from London to Dubai, then from Dubai to Mumbai. Essentially, hub and spoke airlines fly you in and out of their hubs to get you to where you want to go. That was the business model generally used at the time of the 757, making it not such a great fit for many airlines. Then came budget airlines, with their shorter, direct flights that made money. Lots of money. They used direct flights multiple times a day and low fares to attract their customers, which took away mainstream airlines' passenger flow. This then made major airlines realise something. Time is valuable. As I just mentioned, budget airlines used a different business model in which they had short and direct flights. While many airlines had already established a presence at their hubs and it would be very hard for them to operate direct flights to all of their destinations, there was one aspect of the budget airline model that they could incorporate. A higher frequency of flights, but still having the same capacity. 
This would only be possible with multiple low capacity aircraft flying the same route every day. For example, instead of one 747 flight between Manila and Cebu every day, you could split it into four A320 flights instead, departing at different times, allowing more flexibility for passengers. This is one reason for the rise in narrow body flights. To increase the frequency of flights giving passengers more flexibility when choosing when to fly. But this isn't the main reason for the rise in narrow body flights. While the airline model does play a part in the main point, demand also plays a part. This is because flying isn't an enjoyable experience. While I'm sure all the av geeks like me scoff at that statement, it's unfortunately true. Imagine being crammed into a nose assaulting bus for eight hours. While you and I might enjoy the sensation of being at 36,000 feet in the air and feeling like turbulence was a big roller coaster ride and loving the roar of the engines, that's not what flying is like for most. In actuality, many just perceive it as an expensive inconvenience to get from point A to point B. Yeah, that's what flying is like. People want direct flights, but airlines can't afford it. They are not prepared to put a giant Boeing 777 on a route that would barely fill half of the plane. So what plane is efficient and has the necessary capacity for low demand routes? Let's think. It must be small, efficient and comfortable. The answer is narrow body aircraft. So there we have it people, we've gone full circle. Let's go back to that Air Canada 737 MAX 8 over the Atlantic. It was flying from Halifax to London Heathrow. Narrow bodies fill up the routes that weren't possible with large planes, opening up more possible routes from which an airline can attempt to profit off of. After all, in the aviation industry, any profit is good profit, and as many have said, to go into the market, you invest a billion in return for a million. If this idea of small planes is so great, why hasn't it been done efficiently and effectively before? Look at the Boeing 707 for me. Count the number of engines. Now look at the Airbus A320. Once again, count the number of engines. Notice anything? An Airbus A320 has two engines, whereas the 707 has four. Why did older airplanes need four? The level of efficiency on today's narrow bodies could never be matched a few decades ago, because apparently it would be a cold day in hell before I let twins fly long haul over water routes said the FAA administrator in 1980. Airplane technology wasn't as advanced as it is today, and so two engines was too big of a risk. But as planes began to advance, restrictions were relaxed due to the changing ETOPS regulations. In fact, changing regulations allowing for more efficiency actually condemned the A340 to fail, which you can learn all about after this video. So. Planes can now fly with two engines. Those engines are efficient, and that's perfect. Airlines can now fly efficient twin-engined aircraft. An airline sees a route with low demand, but still enough to feasibly open a route there on a narrow body. So, an airline takes advantage of modern rules and regulations and buys a narrow body aircraft. And there you go, the airline gains profit. So. The modern aviation world has allowed for new methods and ideas to become reality, enabling the things we are seeing today. Narrow bodies are now flying long haul, because they are the only aircraft fit for the job. Gone could be the days of the super jumbos, here come the days of the long haul narrow body flights. But how about the future? With the 757 gone, and other aircraft like it non-existent, what plane will replace it? Well, that's a topic for another time. For now, thanks for watching. Please subscribe to never miss more fascinating aviation content and to learn more about the A340 story, click the video on the left of the screen. But for now, thanks and bye.